Dawson, Valentine's Day. Special dedication to Luke Penton and his gift of storytelling. Let's get straight into that. Prologue. Mr. Price, is Val your real name? Well, my dear lady, Val is a shortened version of the name my mother and father bestowed upon me as a child. My name is actually Valentine Price. It's kind of feminine, so I shortened it to Val when I came west. Miss Sherry smiled. Nonsense. Oh, it's a fine name. I rather like it. You don't think it's a bit feminine? Well, absolutely not. It's... And Sherry paused, searching for the right word. Price, Sidney Strider horse had borrowed, looked at her with an amused look upon his face. It's what, Miss Sherry? Oh, it's romantic. St. Valentine is the patron saint of love and romance. Perhaps. He looked towards the ground. He was embarrassed. Now, Mrs. Dawson, I, I don't think this kind of conversation is appropriate between a single man and a married lady. Besides, what would your husband think? Well, he probably wouldn't think he has anything to worry about, Val, after hearing what you just said. I have been sitting quietly in the shadows of a stand of elm trees on my horse banjo, listening to Sherry and Price. Now I nudged Banjo out of the trees and walked him towards Price and Sherry. He could see the gun belt I had dropped over my saddle horn. I saw he took a deep swallow. I was amused. I brought Banjo to a stop abreast of his horse. I looked him over. He was nervous. I could imagine the scenarios playing out in his head. I reached down, took the gun and gun belt off the saddle horn and tossed it to him. Are you riding with my wife or with anyone in these mountains, Val? You need to have one of those. That belonged to Arkansas Pete. It's yours now. I said with a smile. And Price laughed. Huh, I, I, I thought... I was going to defend my wife's honour. If I needed to, I would. No, Val. You need that and I've cleaned it, oiled it, and filled the belt with both lead and silver bullets. Because... Oh, you never know. Right, Morgan? Sherry said. Right. I watched Price strap on the gun belt, tie the holster down and check the loads. He did all this as if it wasn't his first time. He lifted his head and both of us clocked. He lifted his head and both of us locked eyes. He laughed and said he was only repeating what he'd seen me do. And had he done it correctly? I just nodded. I had a feeling in my gut that Valentine Price had more than a rudimentary knowledge of guns. In fact, I thought he could have been someone else in another time. Many known men had taken new identities new looks and new careers when they had gotten too familiar with a gun. I had seen it happen before. The Sherry and Price had been out for a ride. The air was turning cooler, and I suspected an early winter. The Chato and Cherokee had built more permanent shelters. They had worked for new wool blankets and had farmed a little plot to have the vegetables, which they'd trade if they had enough. Sherry, Price and I rode back to our community, and it would be the last day we'd enjoy for a while. Chapter 1 The darkness fell when I sat drinking a beer on the porch. I didn't light the lantern we kept hanging on the wall, nor did I sit in front of a well-lit window. The front door opened, and Price stepped out into the night. He inhaled a lungful of autumn air, and slowly exhaled. He took the chair next to me. I offered him a cigar, and he accepted. We sat in silence. He had something upon his mind, as did I. And I figured it was time to get mine off my chest. After all, Sherry wasn't out here with me to give me that look I sometimes got. Who are you, Price? He puffed on his cigar. I knew he was thinking about how to answer. So I decided to push him along. Oh, you're not an outlaw. You're not a gambler. Although you do play a good game of five-card draw. He smiled, and I continued. I know you're not a gunfighter, although you handle that gun and gun belt very well. Who are you? He cleared his throat. <clears throat> Morgan, have you ever heard of Shorty Doyle? I have. Short, burly man. He and his sons are the killers. He was, and two of his boys were with him when he died. The other two are still searching for their killer. What's that got to do with you? Are you one of his boys? No. I'm the man who killed Shorty and the two boys that died. And nothing catches me off guard, but that confession huh, got my undivided attention. You killed Shorty Doyle and 
two of his four sons? I did. You see, Shorty and his boy shot down and killed the city marshal of Ridgewalk three years ago, when the marshal's wife and little girl, just about Miss Olivia's age, ran out into the street. He gunned them down, too. What's that got to do with you? The marshal and his wife and child were my family. The marshal was my younger brother. Were you there? Oh, I was there, hiding like a coward. Oh, Doyle knew I was cringing inside. I really was a school teacher. I just, I just didn't like guns. This maniac kept calling me to come out, join my family in death. I found a spare gun belt and gun, strapped them all and stepped out into the street. And I gunned down Doyle and his two boys. So, why haven't I heard of you? I changed my name. I changed my vocation, my looks and my name. I call myself Val Price. You might have heard of me by my real name. Price Valentine. Price Valentine? Yes, I'd heard of him. Nothing bad, just a friendly guy who put himself in harm's way a few times. He was supposed to be fast with a gun. An educated man. And two years ago, he'd vanished. That was what I'd heard. And now he was sitting next to me, smoking a cigar. I have another question. Did you come here just to remain hidden from the Doyles, or...? I told you, I had been a teacher. I came here hoping to teach and remain hidden. This is the closest place I've called home in a while. You people, the closest I have to family. Price, you know what we deal with around here. You know this is a haunted land. You also know I expect every adult to carry a gun. No gun fights, we just have to look out for each other. Where the gun? As far as I'm concerned, it's still simply Price. No first, no last name, just Price. Ah, that's more than fair, Morgan. Thank you. Well, thank you for the truth. If the two Doyle boys come around, let me and Tim handle them. Miss Sherry enjoyed her friendship with Price. Each morning around ten o'clock, one or the other would come by, either the backboard we'd inherited from the late Mr. Ambrose and his centuries-old which Elizabeth Bathory, who called herself Lady de Costa, and they would ride down to one of the tributaries of the Mountain Fork River, where they would eat a light lunch and fish. Many nights Price joined us in a cafe for fried catfish he and my wife had caught. And as it began to get colder, I'd go out on horseback with Price and hunt deer and hog. He really didn't know much about field dressing, but he learned fast. Once we managed to kill a large white-tailed buck, and as we were walking to collect it, a wild man stepped out from behind a huge tree, threw the deer over its shoulder, and walked away. And Price thought that we should fire on it. I'd fire on it if it were a Janosqua, a Goodway, or a werewolf. But that's a wild man. As long as he leaves me alone, I'll leave it alone. I knew some of these monsters would become more active once we get a big snow. And by mid-November, I had teams of men gathering firewood for the entire community. Sherry was usually suffering from melancholy, when it was too bad or nasty to get out. I was busy moving cattle in closer to the crossing, filling the extra corrals with either cattle or horses. I'd had Price move into the main building and asked him to read from both his library and my own. Near our jail, we built a simple A-frame building, which I set aside in case we had overnight guests. A woodcook stove was installed for the guests to use their own pots, pans and coffee pots to prepare themselves food. If they had nothing to eat or drink, well, Sherry and Agnes did. I wasn't there the day the Doyle boys rode into the crossing. I was told they looked the place over. They looked Sherry over, too. Price had spotted them and had immediately strapped his gun belt on. He sent word to Tim, and then he shaved. He had a beard for years, but he shaved, brushed his hair out, and put an old hat on, and went downstairs. What he saw angered him. Kyle Doyle? The younger of the two had Sherry backed up to the wall, trying to force her to drink with him. His older brother Kevin Doyle stood at a bar, laughing and covering Slick with his gun. Both noticed Price on the landing. Price looked at Sherry. Have these reprobates injured you, my dear? He asked her. Ah, she your woman. And what's a reprobate? No, the lady's husband is away at the moment. Perhaps, perhaps I can fill in for him. Both men laughed. We think we'll lock y'all up in the jail across the way and share this fine-looking woman. I'll die first, you bastards, I was told Sherry said. 
They laughed and Kyle Doyle buffalo Sherry with his gun. Kevin laughed and buffalo slick crushing his hat. They began dragging Sherry out and Price called out, If you lay hands on that woman, I was going to lay more than hands on her, said Kevin Doyle, firing, creasing Price along his head. Price dropped to the floor. And by the time I had returned, Price had taken a big grey gelding and saddlebags full of supplies and had started out after the Doyles. Tim and Olivia had been locked up in the jail. They'd been pistol wet. Thankfully, they hadn't touched Olivia. Slick had to have four stitches in his head. No one else had been injured. I had Amos pack my saddlebags and I grabbed a coat out of storage for Sherry. I'm going with you, Morgan, said Lazy Eye. Uh, Tim's been hurt. You and Lon have to stay here. Special deputies. I want to go with you. Price ain't going to be any help. And I had started out the door, turned and looked at Lazy Eye and Lon. Rowdy, Price is Price Valentine. Why, well, he's dead. Nope. He reversed his name, took off his gun and went back to teaching. I pity those two if they've harmed Sherry. Morgan, if they did, I'm going to kill them. If Valentine doesn't beat me to it. I left my home behind. I left my friends behind. I left all behind because I knew what monsters human beings can be. My wife was a pretty young woman. I blame myself for leaving her alone on a cold and unforgiving November. Tim and Olivia had been locked up in a cold cell. At least they had installed shutters. Slick had been beaten over the head. Price wanted to fight, but I think he thought I'd walk in and he wouldn't have to do anything. Well, he damn well dealt himself in. And I prayed he could carry his end of the load. I wove in and out of the deep timber. I hadn't shaved in several days. I was cold and hungry. Amos had fry me a couple of chickens and I would eat the cold piece of chicken in the saddle rather than stop. But I had to stop from time to time. That banjo was a strong horse, but he needed to rest and food too. I came out of the timber and discovered a cabin. White smoke poured out of the chimney. I could make out someone walking back and forth in front of the window. I had no idea who might be inside. I didn't know where I was, other than... I had no idea who might be inside. I didn't know where I was, other than I should be in the Arbuckle Mountains. I rode up to the cabin. A small corral with a couple of stables sat near the cabin. Just sit perfectly still, mister, or you'll be checking in at those pearly gates. And I held both hands up. Oh, you're getting mighty feisty, Price. I see you had to finally stop and rest too. Dawson, it's really you. Oh... Put your hands down. Go inside and get warm. I'll see to your horse. I lowered my hands, took my saddlebags inside, and began trying to get warm. When Price came into the cabin, he was smiling, but he wasn't happy. I wish I could tell you I knew where she was, Morgan. At best, I should have been only a few hours behind them. I'd offer you something to eat, but it's all gone. I took the cold chicken out of my saddlebags and set it on the old wooden table. I unwrapped it gestured towards it. Uh, help yourself. Uh, he didn't need anyone to twist his arm. He ate like he was famished. Uh, I'm going to kill the Doyle's price. I should have, he said. Uh, you might have gone and Sherry Slick and yourself killed. And I looked into the flames of the fireplace. Sherry may already be dead. You don't think I already considered that? They are killers! I spent ten years of my life tracking the scum who murdered my brother, sister and parents. I alone survived because I wasn't home. But I pinned on a badge. I became a United States Deputy Marshal. I obtained John Doe warrants and brought them all in dead or alive, but mostly dead. I spent years alone. I finally married someone who understood. I've killed men and monsters, undead and unclean creatures. And I stopped and looked at him, my anger boiling over. When I find the Doyle boys, I'm going to kill them for what they've done to Sherry. And I sat down heavily in the chair. I was tired and soon dozed off in the chair next to the fireplace. Price apparently put a blanket over me. He'd not take my gun off. Price had stretched out on the floor near the fire. I felt a blast of cold air and realised the front door had been opened. Price had turned to face the door. I didn't know what he was searching for or whoever or whatever was coming inside. My right hand felt for my forty-five comfortably in my holster. The wind stirred the embers in the fireplace. I was about to move when it entered the front door. It crawled silently into the room. 
and it was solid white with two black eyes and little, if any, nose. And that's mouth. Well, it had no lips, but just looked like a slash. It hissed and continued its slow crawl towards Price, continuing to hiss. It opened its rather large mouth and its teeth like sharp hunting knives. It rose to its knees and started to reach for Price when Price opened up upon it. It screamed and made for the open door. Blood smeared on the floor leading back to the door. Price was up quickly and out the door. He stuck his head out and then pulled it back inside, shut the door and laid a block across it. Price said, That? Well, that was close. But I knew someone or something was out there watching me earlier. When I came inside, I left the door unblocked because well, I wanted to see what was out there. You could have gotten killed, I said. Uh, you would have killed it if it had gotten me, he replied. Yeah, maybe. I've never seen anything like that. I saw one in Michigan once when I was drifting. The Indians up in that region call them the Wendigo. I understand the ones you encountered look much different. Yeah, they do. You were gambling we both wouldn't be asleep. I slept here, my head turned towards the door. The cold wind, it awakened me. We were never in any real danger. I was ready. You needed to rest. Now we both can rest. We have to find your wife. I slept, but it hadn't been a good, sound sleep. I woke up every little bit making sure the fire hadn't gone out, or Price hadn't unbarred the door. I heard his name before. Price Valentine. Where had I heard it? He'd been a teacher, an educated man, but the way he could handle a gun. Well, I was packing my gear up and I noticed Price checking the loads in his rifle and a forty five I'd given him. Then he produced another pistol from behind his back. Another forty five Colt with a seven inch barrel. A long barrel. Yes, but no longer than the one you carry. Yeah, that's true. I didn't know you owned another sidearm. Oh, yes. I used to carry it on my right-hand side, but when I stopped drifting, I put it away and vowed never to use it again. I heard of a man who wore a red shirt, like yours, short black jacket, like yours, black pants and a black broad brim hat, and a flat crown, like yours. Gunman. Didn't sell his gun, rode around helping folks who truly needed help. School teacher, just like you. Ned Buntline. Wrote a few stories about him. Folks called him the name Buntline used. The Drifter. You are the Drifter, aren't you, Price? <sighs> yes. That's the name Ned gave me. Faster than Masterson. More honest than any of the herbs. Yes. That's me, Price Valentine, the Drifter. God, I hate that name. All I ever wanted was to be a school teacher. Uh, then ride back to the crossing and teach. Someone would eventually piece my name together. Uh, then change it. Become Victor Price, educator. Yes, but I like the name Vincent. Yes, Vincent Price. Uh, no one's going to accept a name like Vincent. Too frightening. Uh, he sighed. Ah, I suppose you are right. But I still like that name. Well, I stick with Victor. Trust me. Now, let's ride if you're traveling with me. Chapter 2. Let's get straight into that. And the doors were riding hard. They had both used Sherry. But Sherry knew I was behind them somewhere. It was possible, she told me later, that at times she felt I had gotten ahead of them. She didn't resist their assaults. The spirit inside her laughed in her head at times and whispered in her mind that it was devouring their seed. And someday it would leave her body and mind then. It wouldn't be stopped. And then Sherry said, that it would laugh. Now they were held up in an abandoned farmhouse with a warm fire. Both men were filthy and needed baths, shaves and clean clothes. Sherry had wrapped an old blanket around her and sat warming herself by the fireplace. Hey, woman! Kevin Doe had snarled. Look around. See if there's any grub left here to eat and fix it. My brother and me, well, we're hungry. And Sherry knew better than to challenge either one of them. She found about three pounds of beans and enough coffee to make a couple of pots of coffee, an onion and three potatoes. I need some wood for the stove and water for the coffee. And they both laughed. Ha! <laughs> then you better get busy and bring some in, woman. 
Well, Sherry opened the door. She had expected a bullet in her back, but it never came. She piled wood on the porch, took a large wooden pail, and went to the well and drew a bucket of water. Ice floated in the bucket. She turned to go back inside when she saw the rabbit. She thought quickly. Snatching a rock, she threw it, and to her surprise, hit and killed the rabbit. She heard the voice in her head, soothing, taunting. Sherry, give me control. I can end all of this. Leave your host body. Help you escape. I will kill one and possess one. Inhabit a new body. All you have to do is release me. The spirit murmured. She violently shook her head no. The door burst open and Kyle Doyle stood there scowling. Get that wood and water and get in here. He noticed the dead rabbit. A bonus, rabbit. You can skip the beans tonight and make a stew, he said. Well, I'd better get to eat tonight and I'm not talking about licking the plates, replied Sherry. Sometime during the night it began to snow. Sherry hadn't been sexually assaulted and so she lay on the hardwood floor and tried to figure where it might be. The Wendigo spirit spoke to her again. It told her with the coming of the cold and the snow. It could tell her it was close. Then it asked again for her to release her control. It had begun to snow, but eventually I received word from some Choctaws who were trying to find a better place to camp that they had seen two white men and a white woman rising higher into the hills. They were being followed by a creature which they felt did not belong in these mountains. This creature was well over ten foot tall, covered in hair the colour of snow. From a distance, it appeared to be a bear, only much larger, and it moved like a man. Even the face-eaters avoided this beast. The Indians said they'd asked for food and they'd given them a couple of chickens to eat, some potatoes and a couple of onions. They tried to give the woman clothing, but the two men would never not allow their woman to give anything to her. And they continued to move north, just with the strange creature. The price was actually quite good on the trail. He spoke Spanish, French, and a little of the Choctaw language. Most times when he spoke to me, it was the price at first met, suave and sophisticated, choosing his words carefully, hoping if he was insulting me, or he wouldn't know it. Other times he talked like a Western man. From time to time, he'd make a comment about the white thing, he'd shun and speculate about what it might be. And that led into theories. And then he said one late afternoon, Morgan, they've stopped moving. Uh, what? They are around in these woods somewhere. Uh, he believe Miss Sherry is still alive. Uh, Price, I have high hopes, you're right. They are lazy. They can't do for themselves. Their old man, older brother, even their mother, were like that. Uh, you got to know them well over the years. I uh, know your opposition, if you're trying to avoid a fight. From stories I'd heard about the man of folks called the Drifter, I'd have thought you'd turn tables and look for them. Ah, uh, drifting seemed preferable. Eventually, I was going to run into one or both of them. Wait! he exclaimed. We reined up our horses. Miss Sherry is alive! Look through those trees! I looked and all I saw at first was what I took to be a deserted farmhouse and a tool shed. And then I saw her. Sherry was set in snares for rabbits or anything else she could catch. She looked worn and pale. There was no sign of life from the house. I shot my forty four forty lever action rifle. Price pointed towards a small deer pouring at the frozen ground, trying to find some graze. You stay here. I'm going to shoot the deer. When he come out to see what's going on, you shoot him. And Price climbed off his horse and led it through the trees. He was watching the deer. I, well, I was watching the door. My limbs snapped and the deer's head jerked up. Price had been very careful. He had not stepped on any fallen branches. Yet the deer turned to run and Price took a shot, dropping the deer in his tracks. The front door busted open and big Kevin Doyle screamed at Sherry, wanting to know who fired the shot. Well, she couldn't answer. Doyle weighed close to 300 pounds and he stepped out farther, raised his hand to slap Sherry and I fired twice in quick succession. My first bullet struck the wall behind his head. He grabbed up Sherry as my second shot burned into his right cheek. Before I could get a third shot, Shay had been jerked to her feet and put in front of Doyle. He had a pistol to her head. Is that him, sweet meat? Is that your big, dangerous husband? I told you he'd come. 
Hey, you! He screamed. Any more funny business from you and I kill the bitch. You understand me? I understand. Miss Sherry, it's me. You know me as Val Price. Mr. Doyle and his rotten-smelling kid brother know me as Price Valentine. Valentine! I stopped running, Doyle. Now if you and your baby brother are hungry, I shot a deer just in front of that shed. You think we're going to come out and get it? Send a woman. The spirit share in Sherry's mind had spoken softly in her mind. Release me, woman. Give me control. I promise you no one will die except this fat pile of dung and his sibling. Release me. Release me. And from the trees, I heard Sherry say, I don't know how. Well, the spirit in Sherry's mind grew still. A strange smile crossed her face. And she began to hum. It was like nothing I'd ever heard. Doyle pulled her back inside and slammed the door shut. What a strange turn of events. What a white creature hid inside the shed. The horses would provide him a mill, but it hurt the cool. The cool promised him a new body, a new, experienced spirit. He just had to wait. If no one claimed the deer by the time the sun dropped behind the trees, the deer's body was his to claim and do as it wanted. What he wanted in this lava state was a warm, hot human blood and meat. The spirit inside Sherry, which she had fought so hard to suppress, was now in charge. And through her eyes, it measured the two evil men. Oh, it hungered for their evil. It knew an unfinished creature of its kind was nearby. It caught it to come close, close enough that it could join with him. The unfinished one's physical form and its own spirit. It would not allow the human woman to be harmed until it had taken its new physical form. I was under the impression Morgan Dawson never missed, said Price. Ah, oh, I can miss a shot from time to time. What was that grandstand play you made? I didn't want them to know you had caught up. Sherry needed to think you were not here yet. Well, I started to snow. Just a dustling, probably. No big issues yet. Price! Came a shout from the house. Yeah? The woman needs food. I'm coming out to cut a little meat off that deer. You shoot me, my little brother kills the woman. <sighs> Come ahead. And Kevin Doyle walked out of the house and into the yard. Price! You playing games? Where's the deer? Right where I dropped it. Oh, it's gone. Oh, it must have been drug off. Well... If we go hungry, that bitch goes hungry too. I tossed my saddlebags to him. I knew there was enough to feed them and Shay would recognize my bags and know I was here. Doyle, shouted Price. Here, take my saddlebags. He tossed them to the porch. There's provisions in them, but the woman eats first. I'd sure hate to find out that she had starved. Ah, yeah, she'll eat. Yes, the spirit said. She shall eat, for she will need all her strength. I sat there planning. If it was more than a dusting of snow, I'd honestly try to get to the house and well, I then realized that that's what they'd want. Even if they didn't kill me, or well, they were sure to kill Sherry. Chapter 3 Let's get straight into that. After everything was finally settled, I figured out how the white beast we'd encountered figured into all of that happened. The beast must have hidden inside the old shed. It waited until dark and emerged to pull the deer into the shed. It never used its strength to hang the deer from the rafters in the shed, using rope. Then, in a way only known to the old gods, the white beast which I know now was a wendigo in a lava-like form, merged with the form of the dead deer. The creature was reborn, but knew nothing about itself. Its consciousness needed a spirit, a spirit of one of the ancient gods. The spirit inside Sherry's head began to stir. Kyle Doyle noticed sweat beating around her forehead, her face flush. She eased herself to the floor in front of the fireplace. Kyle Doyle bent over her and felt her forehead. Ah, Kevin, this woman's burning up with fever. If she dies, well, we're going to have to fight. And while we were trying to figure out what to do, Sherry's mouth opened. A mist began coming forth from her mouth. 
from her ears, nose and eyes. The mist of fog eased out and found its way out of the house. The mist, if that was what you would call it, made its way into the shed. But through the cracks in the door and walls, one could have seen several shades of light. I was dozing by the fire. Price was deep into thought. We knew nothing about what was going on. Price! came the shout. Yes, he responded. The woman's sick. We're leaving here, but we're taking her with us. We'll leave her down the trail towards Sulphur Ridge. Ah, you try to follow us before daylight, and she's dead. Now it was time I did speak. I figured if she wasn't dead, if she was sick, a run like this in this weather, I would finish her off. You, you Doyles. I'm Morgan Dawson. Ha! The man speaks, snickered Kyle Doyle. Well, I'll say your piece, shouted Kevin Doyle. If my wife is dead, or if she's killed, I will follow you to the ends of the earth, and I will kill you. That's my word. You don't scare us none. By the way, Dawson, snarled Carl. I broke her in real good for you. They drug Sherry out the door and down off the porch. Both Price and I stepped out from the cover of the trees. They were standing beside the shed door. Something fell to the floor inside, and all of us heard movements. You boys got another man hidden inside. Cow, open the door. Kill that hombre. Sherry mumbled. Don't open it. Please, don't open it. Open it, brother. Kill whoever's in there. Then, he calmed down and continued. Then I'm going to kill this smart bitch. And that was all that I could take. Price yelled, No! But Kyle jerked the door open, and saw we were standing there and froze. Both Price and I fired. Price's bullet took Kyle in the stomach. The boy looked sick. He glanced at Cherry, who was still shielding Kevin, raised his gun weakly, and Price's gun barked again, slamming a bullet into his heart. Kevin had glanced into the building, dropped Sherry, and began shooting into the shed. And I shouted his name, and he spun and fired wildly at me. I put six holes in his chest, so close you could cover them with a playing card. Then it came out of the shed. It was a wendigo. It reached down and lifted Carl's body in a clawed hand, raised it easily into its mouth, eight foot high, and bit his head off. It was enormous. It tossed the rest of the body towards the inside of the shed. It cocked its head towards me, pointed towards Sherry, and spoke in a raspy voice. She is yours. Yes, you destroyed my body once. I took her body and mind. I wanted to survive. I understand. These two hurt her, tried to make her with child. The dear head with dagger-like teeth tried to smile. I ate them before they could form. I did good. You did excellent. Thank you. I require food. I take these two. I take them. They pointed towards Price. Your friend? Always. He may live also. I go home after resting. Take woman and leave this place. Do not follow me to my home in the north. Uh, we won't. Gather your horses, leave, and remember, do not follow me. When he go turned his back on us, dragged Kevin's body into the shed, and began to eat. I wrapped Sherry in a warm blanket, put her on her horse, and kissed her. Price? She said, leaning towards him, after we fed her some cold bacon. Thank you. She kissed Price on the cheek. Uh, Price... I said as we started a long ride back to the crossing. And you call yourself any damn name you choose. And he kept the name Price Valentine. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Absolutely exhilarating, chest-pounding, nail-biting action and terror from the incredible mind of David Holly, exclusive to the DMT Forest of Fear channel. Big thank you, David, once again for letting us go back through this incredible collection of yours. I really do hope you're enjoying this as much as I am as we revisit the good times and the adventures 
of the Hostile Intent series. Well, guys and girls, as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you can pen a story packing that much punch, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. As always, guys and girls, I hope you're well and happy and taking a fight back to life and trying to stay fit and focused. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.